Okay. Good morning. Um, welcome to the seventh in our series of military history uh, program events. Uh, the entire proceedings for today are going to be live streamed and they're going to be on the record, including the questions and answers. If you do have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box on Zoom. I'm Andy Young. I'm the Military Sciences Community Manager here at RUSI. Um, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Sam Jardine, a geopolitics specialist and public historian, to discuss Gateway Falklands, the geopolitics of Britain's Antarctic Empire, 1942 to 61, and its Falklands legacy. Sam is the head of research at London Politica and is mentored in the Rusi Military Sciences Rising Stars project. Sam specialises in the geopolitics, policy, mineral politics and security of the polar region, space and global Britain. He holds an MA in modern history from King's College London and a BA on in history from the Open University. So Sam, it would be great to, uh, great to introduce you to, to everybody uh, today. Thanks very much, Andy. It's a real pleasure to be here. And hello, everyone. Thank you for giving up some time in your morning to attend, attend my talk on this. Um, so I've got three key points that I'm going to make about this. And the first one and the main point is that the Falklands where I'm going to integrate it into an Antarctic context, uh, which makes it part of sort of this Falklands War, sort of 1980s um, spat, and it puts it into a longer term competition over the Falkland Islands dependencies, which are the islands around the Antarctic at the time, as well as the Antarctic continent itself. Um, and specifically on this point, I'm going to argue that Britain's, and I quote from the British ambassador to Chile in 1957, Britain's amazingly erratic um, Falklands and Antarctic policy was an issue in shaping perceptions and events in the longer term. Uh, the second point and link to this I'm gonna make is the Antarctic treaty system, uh, which the UK has normally heralded as like one of these sort of founding winner sort of um, powers on it was actually a loss for the UK when you actually look at the policy of what they wanted and then what they got. It was, it was by no means you know, a huge loss. They weren't sort of bitter about it um, much, but um, it was something you, you can't really say that the UK met its aims uh, in what it set out to achieve at the ATS. Um, and also, because this is from a UK perspective um, and through UK documents, they perceive, it's, it, I want to make the point that they perceive that the US was a rival in the region to United Kingdom's interests and that the US, according to them, favoured Argentina and Chile over Britain's position when it came to actually the nitty gritty details of the competition. Uh, so, and as part of that perspective, I'm of course using British government documents, correspondence and diaries from the National Archives at Kew British Library. Um, so it's a British official perception of events. Um, I'd also like to note, of course, I owe a huge debt to previous Antarctic scholars, including Klaus Dodds, Shirley Scott, Stephen Haddlesey and Adrian Hawkins, among others, um, who have, you know, done a lot of work, the nitty gritty work that I've managed to build on. And as new archival evidence have sort of been unleashed, I've been able to like access that. And there's still some more to come, actually. So, you know, next decade should be quite exciting for uh, Antarctic geopolitics. So quickly, just going into some background around the ATS and sort of an overview of what's um, what the area is like. And then I'll go into the sort of three phases um, of the story. Um, so before 1961's Antarctic Treaty System, Britain's Antarctic holdings were under the Falkland Island dependencies. Uh, they were islands and elements of mainland Antarctica. Um, the Falkland Islands was the capital of this imperial province, providing the economic, logistics and strategic support. It also helped that it was populated. One of the few islands in the region that actually had a sort of British population that was permanent. Um, its governor of the Falkland Islands headed up the um, Falkland Island dependencies. Uh, and he was also responsible for supporting the Falkland Island Dependencies Survey, which was Britain's sort of vehicle for sovereign presence that complemented their regulation of international nomadic whaling industry as, as a basis for sovereignty. And that becomes like important later. Um, so 1961 saw South Georgia and the Falklands excluded from the Antarctic Treaty System for a variety of reasons that we can get into later. Uh, and this did shift Argentina's focus from the competition in the dependencies to now looking at the Falkland Islands, because the dependencies competition, it was actually winning. And Britain was very aware that Argentina was winning. Um, and this is a sort of complex arena. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty System is sort of, the competition is still ongoing in various forms, both in the Antarctic, despite the claims being frozen. Uh, and also the Falkland Islands can be integrated into a sort of the violent kind of part of that. It's, a, it's an area where violence was still allowed as a means to pursue policy. Um, because it was excluded from the treaty and also that violence is a background for this wider competition that I'm going sort of going to go into. Um, so phase one of this sort of wider competition I reference is from 1942 to 1951 and I call it base racing. 
Uh, and the context of this in the 1940s is the sort of fall of France. Uh, Dunkirk's happened, Battle of Britain's raging. And at this point, Chile and then Argentina make or in their view reiterate their claims to the Antarctic, um, which overlap with Britain's claimed areas. So Britain is sort of quite weak and they're kind of taking advantage of this. Um, the sort of a weird issue with these claims to note before I sort of get too into it is that until 1980, the Antarctic was not fully mapped. Uh, 1959, US Congress notes that despite the international geophysical years kind of approach of, you know, this huge scientific effort internationally to map the Arctic, survey it, uh, do scientific research, they're, not, they're still not sure of its value. They have no idea at that point, like what's there and why. And in 1955, um, FIDS, FIDS note to uh, the colonial office, they haven't really mapped the British sectors much. So they don't know what's there. So this whole competition is kind of around this uh, idea of potential economic and strategic, strategic concerns, not the actuality of them. Um, and in terms of sovereignty and how it's portrayed, Argentina and Chile have a very different conception of that to what Britain has. Uh, and we can go into that a bit later as well. They have a different basis for their claims and it clashes quite significantly. Um, so 1940s, Argentina and Chile have made their claims. 1942, in the context of the fall of Singapore having happened for Britain, Argentina send out an expedition accompanied by Chilean officers to the South Shetland Islands. Uh, and in it, they find uh, Deception Island, for instance, which is one of the best ports in the region. It's an island shaped like a donut. So it's a very hostile region. So any port like that is really valuable for you. Uh, they go there, they graffiti, in Britain's perspective, the Argentine flag across the British uh, buildings that are there that are currently empty. Uh, they plant down the Argentinian flag. They set down markers. They do this to Deception Island and several other um, areas in the region. The UK, in response, sends HMS Carnarvon Castle, which is a 20,000 uh, 20, ton cruiser, which has eight six inch guns. Uh, to obliterate the Argentine presence. This isn't the people, this is the flags and stuff, because Argentina, of course, is a key uh, you know, World War II trade partner for the UK, supplying it with food at this point. Um, but they want to, you know, they're making a significant commitment that could be escalatory while they're in a global war to sort of say to Argentina, no, you, you can't have this. So it's, it's clearly, you know, it, it's important to them. Uh, so one month later, of course, you know, it goes there, it, HMS Carnarvon undoes all the work, puts up the British flag again. One month later, Argentina comes back. And it does the same thing again. It, put, it takes down the British flags, puts it up its own, uh, lays down markers. And Britain's colonial office noticed that, you know, that they have local superiority. So it's cheaper and easier for Argentina and Chile to like operate in the region than it is for Britain. And that's without the context, again, of World War II. Um, so Britain decides, you know, we've got to try and do something to change the rules. because It's going to end up in a back and forth that we can't really win, can't really afford. So we'll go with an escalatory point. We'll lay down a permanent physical presence in the region. And so Argentinian parties will be met by sort of peeved British officials who provide a sovereign presence on those islands. Um, and with that, they come up with Operation Tabarin in 1943, which is launched from the Falkland Islands. And it's an escalation built on an underestimation. Uh, so, again, not insignificant resources are used here. Two naval parties, two ships. Uh, with all the supplies that go with it. They establish free bases uh, in the region. Ostensibly, it's, it's a secret operation to begin with, and ostensibly it's to set up, you know, it's, it's to counteract German raiding. Uh, and also in the sort of context of a feared Japanese invasion of the Falkland Islands, it's kind of included in that kind of, you know, variety, but it's, its real intention is to kick out, uh, sort of permanently prevent Argentina from making any inroads in its sovereign claims. Um, this, you know, they set up three bases, they leave a magistrate and a postman around, again, for those sort of officials there. Not much to do, but they're, they're just there. In 1945, they'd be relieved by the Falkland Island Dependence Survey, which is now an entirely civilian outfit, not the military one that the Operation Tabarin was. Uh, and the FIDS is meant to do scientific research and survey, but the Colonial Office made clear that that's not the real reason they're there. That's just a nice little aside to justify to the world and the Treasury and also, you know, produce some nice science, of course, but actually it's just to physically be there. Um, and it was hoped this would end the competition entirely. Uh, and but it went, it was, you know, and the Argentina would come and negotiate with Britain and Brit the Admiralty are quite clear. They're quite willing to let the Argentine flag fly over the Falklands and sort of the region if they can, you know, actually have the administration of it. So you can sort of have the shared power sharing. And they thought that would bring Argentina's stable. It doesn't. Argentina and Chile instead decide to match Britain's base building with their own. They build bases very near to where Britain's building bases. And you have this sort of period up until 1951 of like, various bases setting up to each other, some sort of ridiculous ones like right next to each other. Uh, and then sort of, you know, tense but cordial relations. But at sea, there's this kind of escalation going up and up and up um, where there's more naval resources from all parties coming in every year to challenge it. Uh, and it gets quite bad so that in 1949, they actually have to sign a tripartite naval pact to kind of de-escalate things because you're at the point of conflict and incidents happening that could be misconstrued. Uh, and Britain's quite happy with this tripartite pact because they feel it gives them local superiority. 
because they get to have one frigate routinely deployed there. Chile gets one frigate and Argentina is left with only having armed transports. And so they feel it's a win. Of course, the Admiralty is less kind of keen on this because it's having to send a frigate down to these very hostile waters that are not very keen on being there. Uh, they actually note in 1951, for instance, they don't send a frigate at all just because they're like, you know, it's not a good use of naval resources. Um, and so going forward, you sort of reach 1950, where this base racing is going on. Uh, and as the Foreign Office actually notes that Argentina is winning it. And they blame the Colonial Office for this. They say in 1950, the Colonial Office made a fatal mistake uh, by cutting the number of FIDS bases down from seven back down to four. Uh, and the effort, the, they claim that the Colonial Office did this for, for budget reasons, budgetary reasons, but also the, the way they argued the case was kind of underhand. Uh, so Argentina at this point uh, has four bases, Chile has two. So it's now sort of putting them back on par. So of all the Operation Tabarams, like extra leads has kind of been wiped out. It's not something Britain will recover from in this. Um, and, and it's also not taken into account in 1948, Argentina and Chile uh, formalized an agreement together. And I apologize for my British pronunciation of this. It will probably be terrible, but it's the La Rosa Vergara Donoso Declaration, which is a security agreement aimed at kicking Britain out explicitly from the Antarctic, where they'll pool their resources to do so. And at the conference, interestingly, Argentina is quite open about the fact that military force is on the table for them. Um, but again, this doesn't seem to filter through to Britain's actual sort of, you know, reporting and analysis of the situation. So you move on to um, phase two, which is this heating up, 1952 to 1956. Uh, and you get 1952, the Hope Bay incident. And it's where a British landing party is trying to re-establish a base at Hope Bay, trying to catch up to the Argent Argentinians again. Uh, and also Hope Bay, they had... Uh, they were absent a base um, at that point, which was really bad for their legal claim. Their legal advisor said this really fatally undermined Britain's sovereign claims if you didn't put a base there. So it's really important. Uh, the British party, though, is met by a group of 50 Argentine soldiers um, who sort of herd them back on the boats and fire over their heads. Uh, and this, according to the Falkland government, is, you know, it's like this is an act of war. It's a live firing on civilians. Um, so a frigate is sent. He requests a frigate. A frigate is sent. The Argentines pull back when they see the frigate and the base is constructed. Um, Argentina does apologize for this. They use sort of they, they play on stereotypes to kind of get around it. They say, oh, you know, you know, Latin Americans, we're hotheads. So, of course, there's going to be some like, and the British sort of who also stereotype the, Argent the Argentinians tend, like tend to agree with this. They're like, oh, of course, you know, we understand. Um, the governor of the Falklands is very peeved, though, that the Foreign Office does sort of just brush this off as an incident. Um, but the apology Argentina made is technically a mistake because according to their policy, and this is something British intelligence notes, Argentine policy is to use force not to not use force against UK military um, operatives because that would escalate. But civilians are up for grabs. They can sort of herd them. They can intimidate them. That's totally fine. They actually assumed that the FIDS personnel were military mistakenly. Uh, and so technically Argentina is in the right. And you kind of see this with Perón a bit later, where he's actually, despite the apology, going to Argentine officers saying, like, you know, this is a great use of time. This is exactly what we need when you're posted there. Be this aggressive. Um, uh, and also, what, what Britain does know is that Argentine military, they're quite heavily armed, unexpectedly so. Uh, they have machine guns and automatic weapons that instead of they're just the sidearms that would be expected of, you know, logistic operations there. So there's kind of this nervousness about this escalation is clearly on the table and Argentina, with the comments they've made, are prepared to use force, um, you know, it quite, quite explicitly. So 1953, we go back to um, Deception Island. Uh, so in 1948, Deception Island had been like the victim of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, an Argentine at that base race, Argentina had set up a base next to the British base on the island. Uh, Britain had no idea what to do at the time. They came up with three options. We go to the UN was option one. They didn't like the UN, though, because uh, Bevan and Attlee's government saw it as a sort of decolonizing institute that were not going to be friendly to Britain's interests. The second option they could do was that they could use military to support civilian forces to evict the Argentinians. And the third idea was that they could just use military force to evict the Argentinians. And they chose the fourth option that wasn't on the table and the, the Foreign Office didn't recommend, which was do nothing. So they sat there, allowed the base to be there. Um, and they just and the, the reason for that is, of course, there's this wider context we can go into of this sort of Argentine trade being important to Britain, it being quite a delicate situation. But by doing nothing on that, it's led to this chain of escalation because it showed Britain, you know, Argent Argentinians perspective is that Britain's not prepared to do the kind of, you know, meet them with force. Uh, so 1953 Deception Islands, uh, the Argentine landing party, there's a large ar armed flotilla comes up. Um, sets a new base on Britain's landing strip and its football fields. And this for the British officials there is too much. You know, you, you cannot put an Argentine camp on our football fields. How, what will we do then? So they, they message back to the foreign office uh, and they 
Churchill's government at the time, they sort of come up with this, they're looking through like the options of what we can do. And this time they decide to take a hard stance. And so the government goes cleverly with a variety of the 1948 option two, which was they send a frigate and some Marines alongside a policeman from the Falkland Islands. And the idea is they're going to arrest the Argentine presence as illegal immigrants and deport them back to Argentina. Uh, and they hope that this will both avoid a military escalation because it's a civilian sort of, you know, initiative doing it. But also it's uh, quite clever in that it would be a, a sort of epitome of British sovereignty. It would be Britain showing its sovereignty by saying we can arrest these immigrants. We have sovereignty over the islands. It sort of adds the administration of their court case uh, it, it, for their sort of legal claims. Um, so there is no plan, though, for what to do if they meet resistance, if this large armed Argentine flotilla, which is a lot of armed transports, a lot of men, if they decide to not be arrested, they don't have a contingency. So it's quite, quite dangerous. And it's just pure luck that it works, because when the frigate arrives with the policemen and the Marines, uh, the Argentine flotilla has left to other islands by this point and have left only a dozen or so Argentine soldiers uh, and who are quite bemused. They're arrested without resistance. They you know, find themselves deported. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, but that for this to be a successful policy, it has to be consistent. And it's noted by um, the chief of staff that if you, you know, if you're going to continue this, you have to start arresting all Argentinians in operating in the in FIDs uh, and kick them out. And of course, they're like, well, that's a lot of effort. That's a lot of expense. That's a lot of resources. So they don't do that. There's no follow through. Uh, and because of this, they find that while Argentina doesn't revisit the deception islands immediately, uh, they do carry on with their activities around the other islands. So they carry on base building elsewhere. And Chile actually, uh, a couple of years later, establishes a base again on Deception Island and nothing happens to it. So it's this escalatory thing followed by no follow through. Uh, and that's the sort of this erraticness of policy. So 1956, Britain's actually getting quite desperate at this point. The Deception Island, you know, wasn't a deterrence enough. Uh, and Argentina now has nine bases in the region. Chile has three. The UK has six. And so the UK's legal advisors are saying, you know, a lot of the claims beyond the Falkland Islands and South Georgia, it's quite a shaky position to be in because Britain's claims are quite contested. They're not secure. Um, so something does need to be done. Uh, and there's a lot of open questions about, like, you know, who discovered what and all that kind of stuff. So the base racing is really important. Uh, Britain's also, it's noted, losing out scientifically. As Another wing of this was sort of the production of scientific evidence to show that we're using good administration for the region and benefiting humanity from it. And they note that Argentina has gone like, you know, hell to leather by publishing a lot, uh, whilst Britain's publishing is sort of dwindling. And so they're saying, like, we need to now rely on quality over quantity to hopefully, you know, keep our case going. Um, but so out of this desperate situation in 1956, Britain goes to the International Court of Justice to take Argentina and Chile there unilaterally. Because uh, Argentina and Chile, of course, do not recognize the authority of the ICJ in this context. They say it's a domestic issue. They're saying it's not a foreign issue for like it is for Britain. For us, it's, it's you know, Antarctica is part of Argentina and is part of Chile. Uh, so the ICJ, of course, finds it can't make a ruling because they refuse to turn up. Um, so Britain does get to present its case. And, you know, it's not sure what to do after it's told, like, you know, we can't make a ruling on this. Lord Salisbury, who's head of the Antarctic Committee, starts doubting whether this expensive game, he says, is worth the candle. Uh, and the option to withdraw entirely is now on the table as a last resort, but a last resort of very few other options. So no one's quite sure what to do. And they're starting to sort of come apart, saying we need to find a way to evict this, but salvage what we can. And this is where phase three begins. So it's 1957 to 1961. And it's the arrival of the Cold War, the Americans and the freezing of sovereignty. So 1957 to 58 is the International Geophysical Year. And this is the this sees the US who has been consistently in the Antarctic, by the way, throughout this point, you know, in 1940, uh, 1946 is Operation High Jump, which is 5,000 men, typical American fashion, 5,000 men, 13 uh, warships, 19 fixed wing aircraft in this huge expedition to the Antarctic. They stay there quite a while. Admiral Byrd before then in 1939 was actually laying the foundations for a US Antarctic claim, if not for the escalation of um, World War II and sort of Japanese moves in the Pacific in 1941. So, you know, if not for Japan, you could have a US claim overlapping with Britain's, overlapping with Chile and Argentina's, which would make a, a you know, a, a new level of mess for this. Um, so International Geophysical Year is an excuse for the US and USSR to come back. They have huge budgets. They've got huge preparation. And the UK is quite intimidated by this. They note that their own efforts by 1958 are going to be insignificant. Like no matter they could have 11 bases, whatever, they're just it's just not going to count anymore. Uh, Argentina and Chile are quite eager to get on this because they're also like, you know, it's a great way to add more bases and be part of an international community with that sort of support who would legitimize us being there. And so you get incidents for Britain, like uh, the Vassal Bay incident, where Argentina sets up a base at Vassal Bay. 
uh, for the IGY. The UK set, wants to set up one near it uh, to duplicate its research, essentially. So not really contributing to the IGY much, but just because they're worried the Argentine, Argentine uh, party wouldn't leave after the IGY and they need to have a presence there. But they can't get to the place to supply it because they don't have an icebreaker, whereas Argentina does. So Britain, instead of asking Argentina for the help, as you'd expect in the IGY sort of cooperation, decides, you know, we can't ask them. That would be a admission of our weakness in there. So we'll go to the US. And they justify it to the US by saying, we do better science than Argentina does. So surely we should, you know, be there. Surprisingly, the US doesn't give them the icebreaker, as far as I can tell. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> the IGY is not good. Um, for, for the UK's position. They have got this idea of a five-year plan at this point. By 1960, they're going to try and like solidify their position as much as they can, find stuff of value, and 1960, negotiate with Argentina and Chile to leave. Uh, and that's the sort of idea. Um, but that's sort of derailed entirely by some comments, firstly in 1957, by a certain Mr. X, who is the US's senior advisor to President Eisenhower. Uh, he's advisor on defense and physical sciences. He's part of the IGY in some capacity. I'd really love to find out who he is, actually. But when asked by some Australian officials about, like, you know, the USSR is now present in Australia's sector of the Antarctic, what do we do if they stay? Uh, he says he's not concerned at all by the Russian presence, as the US can always nuke them. Uh, and it, uh, the direct quote is he could not conceive of a simpler atomic target than the Russian military installation in the Antarctic. And so while this is not an official US position, it is something that's clearly being talked about in their sort of government circles at the presidential level. Um, and that sort of scares the pants off the Australians and their British counterparts who are then informed of this. And it adds to the British urgency to like just, you know, ditch this continent. It's become too costly, too expensive. We don't want to get caught up in a nuclear exchange down here. So there's a lot of noise about leaving, but there's a key point I'd like to bring up on this sort of in the reports about how we're Britain to withdraw. And it's a notification, just a one bullet point that uh, mentions, uh, you know, that if Britain leaves the Falkland Islands dependencies, it leaves the Falkland Islands exposed directly to Argentine sort of efforts to capture them as Argentine, Argentina's attention will shift to them. Um, so the dependencies are kind of a shield in effect where competition is now localised and sort of far less important economically sort of, you know, it's quite a nice arena if you can keep the costs down. Uh, and that's something that I, I feel does come up later and is one of these sort of has a direct impact. Um, so, yeah, the, the UK is looking at leaving. Uh, it needs, though, the US to facilitate talks with Argentina and Chile to get them to the table because Argentina and Chile at the moment feel like they're winning. And quite frankly, they are. Um, so the, and they're also sort of worried about the fact that um, the US is currently in talks in 1957 with Australia and New Zealand for like this kind of thing. What do we do about the USSR? Let's create like a group agreement together. And the Britain's kind of annoyed at being left out of that because it's, it's worried it will lose the support in the Antarctic of Australia and New Zealand. But also, if the US does that, it, it has no recourse. You know, the US probably will be like, that's a job done, ticked, we're off. Uh, and then they're left to Argentina and Chile and trying to negotiate a way out of that, which isn't likely by British estim estimations. Um, so when the US does actually reach out in 1957 to Britain, saying like, what about internationalizing the, Ar and the Antarctic again? And this is something in 1948 the US had done as well. Britain at the time scoffed at that idea, rejected out of hand by saying, you know, we don't want this kind of international UN presence here. It's British sovereign territory. Well, now the US does the same thing again. And Britain's like, OK, actually, we're willing to talk. Uh, so they, they, it does, though, scrap their idea of a 1960s kind of, you know, solidified position and a position of strength to negotiate from because they just have to take this now. Otherwise, there's the risk the US will just, you know, do their sort of agreement with Australia and New Zealand and leave. Um, so this sort of kickstarts the Antarctic Treaty System negotiations starting in 1957, usually are hailed in most narratives as a sort of a win for the UK, a varying win. Some say it's like a great success. Others say it's, you know, it just met their targets, um, achieving, you know, alongside what the US and other Anglo powers wanted. Uh, indeed, the UK was a key sort of negotiator on it. However, the records of what the UK were after in their draft treaty and actually what they got are very different. And I feel this is where there's space to say that Britain was like actually lost out on a lot of what it wanted. Um, so as a last sort of roll of the dice, the last hurrah, the Foreign Office comes up with this great big detailed plan of an internationalized Antarctic system that, you know, they put all claims are pooled together. The economic proceeds are shared between members equally. You know, the one who's mining, it gets slightly more, but like any mineral extraction, everyone gets a slice. So there's this budget imperial model they quite like, seemingly quite like. Uh, and they also have this idea of a high council. And it's based on Bevan's musings, Bevan's musings back in 1948 on a type of internationalization where he just was sort of made a memo, memo and nothing ever came of it. Uh, and it's where Britain cheekily expected to have a consistent majority vote on this High Council because there's Australia and New Zealand. And by their estimation, they could get France and Norway to back them usually on issues of like foreign policy and imperial and this Euro unity kind of idea. 
Uh, and this they could use this to sideline the US, USSR, Argentina and Chile as needed. So essentially, this is going back to way back in 1920s, Britain had this idea of making the Antarctic red. This is doing the same thing, but in invisible ink, essentially. It's saying, you know, we win. This is a great triumph. Unsurprisingly, uh, Britain got none of this. Uh, they offer this draft treaty in their working, their closed working group, which is with Australia, New Zealand and the US. And the US, quite diplomatic, says we'll reserve our rights to discuss this. They never come back to it. By the next year, they're using the US draft document, which has none of the British detailing of and which has, you know, the one we're more familiar with where the claims are now frozen instead of pooled. So this issue of claims is still on the table even today. Uh, and they also have a mechanism within the treaty to potentially reopen that argument at some point in the future, either by timeline or by states, you know, wanting to have that getting sort of the concurrent agreement to do so. So for Britain, this isn't actually at all what they were after. And they're quite worried about this. Um, and so in that view, I would say they kind of lost out from what they wanted. They didn't get the economic exploitation that does where it's head in the 1980s again. But so concluding remarks from this, um, just because I know I had to cut out a lot because I know time, I don't want to keep you here forever. There, there is a ton of it to, though, to go through. Um, so Argentina is sort of, you know, Argentina's attention you know, did switch to the Falklands in South Georgia. The first act of the Falklands War was a salvage party in South Georgia raising the Argentine flag um, there, which sort of kick-started events. And that's because this is Antarctic context, you know, they're the remnants of Britain's fids. It's remnants of this competition that Argentina is allowed to use violence in, you know, the violence is still on the table for it. Um, and at the same time, there's a competition in the Antarctic going on, which is now scientifically based and based on presence and science and still going there. Um, and I'd say I'd argue sort of Britain's back and forth handling of this whole sort of thing, this escalatory event chain through underestimation, their budget imperial approach, they're kind of, you know, back and forth over taking a forceful stance and then passivity. Uh, it's sort of set a policy tone for Argentina and itself that has continued sort of, and you do see this sort of continuing up until 1982. And it was only after the Falklands War you get this consistent idea of, okay, well, you know, the Falklands is a presence, we're here, we'll defend it, um, you know, a consistent policy approach. And so my sort of point about this is, you know, could there have been, if a concrete stance is adopted earlier at any one of these escalatory points, could there have been, how would that impact the Falklands? Probably significantly, I would argue. You know, you might not have a Falklands war, you'd have a very different competition, you might have a very different Antarctic treaty. Uh, and I mean, you know, just to wrap up, a final point that I find like amazing is that during this whole competition, the UK is still selling Argentina and Chile the warships and the weapons and the aircraft they would need to, and, and they would actually utilize against Britain in that region. And so there's a sort of dual handing and very inconsistent policy. One cabinet member in 1953 did have the sort of courtesy say this was an awkward situation. Um, but that's all that's ever really addressed on it. Um, so yeah, that is that is how I would say sort of a brief overview of events and how I think this feeds into the Falklands War itself and how it links into that. Sam, thank you, because that is a it, it's a very quick canter through and it's a huge topic area and the the level of granularity. I mean, as you say, who is Mr. X? Um, and the idea that. Um, <laughs> that there is an atomic answer, an atomic targeting answer to the to the Russians being, or the USSR, sorry, being in, in, in Antarctica is really quite um quite troubling, quite quite interesting. Um uh, even if it is an an un, unofficial one. I think one of the key things there that comes out is this idea, this contested idea of sovereignty. And I know you've you've been doing some work on this elsewhere. Um, but one of the questions we've had from the floor is talking about sovereignty in terms of uh, Argentina seeking support from elsewhere and giving support elsewhere in, in return, uh, specifically reg with regards to um, the People's Republic of China um, and Argentine support for Chinese claims of sovereignty over Taiwan in return for China's support uh, over, over, over the Falklands. How do you see that dynamic playing out in the in the coming years that's a great question actually i i think and you're quite right this is the thing argentina has been doing i'd say from sort of 2016 this kind of diplomatic push uh, again to get the falklands and do, you know instead of doing a military solution it seems to be trying to get like the oas um sort of its regional partners trying to get the us and china has been a, yeah, a key sort of it, it, you know potential partner for this in talks of it and i see you know to take it wider on the falklands and again it's integrated into the antarctic is that China has an Antarctic policy as laid out um, in 2020, the Polar Silk Road, and then 2021, it's sort of expanded on that. Uh, they have this Antarctic policy where they're trying to, in reality, I would argue, shift the 
Antarctic Treaty away from being a, a treaty of conservation to one where exploitation is more apparent. And there's kind of, you know, alleged incidents where, you know, mining for scientific sort of minerals, they're actually just mining or they're, they're sort of using that to prospect. Um, so I, I think in terms of that, again, if you reintegrate the two together, there's a, a significant issue where China might very well like support Argentine's claims to the Falklands. I, I believe it's already made statements of support. Where there's no official policy yet. Uh, the same with Spain as well, um, Argentina over Gibraltar, because that's linked. And Spain has kind of voiced, uh, I think it was last year, voiced something that looked like support for Argentine claims to the Falklands. Um, so you, you have this push and Britain's position there is solid. You know, you, you've got we're going on the demographic referendum approach where if the people choose not to be there and this is in line with the sort of UN ideas of it, um, you know, we, we respect that and we'll respect their decision and keep sovereignty of it. But there comes a point where you've got Argentine claims around the sort of seabed. They've expanded. The UN has accepted those claims. That means seabed mining's on the table. Deep sea mining sort of become an, uh, a rising issue again with sort of this idea of 2030, there'll be a mineral shortage for uh, rare earths and sort of other minerals for this like the green revolution push. And so it's quite lucrative potentially. Uh, and with that, again, going back to what I was talking about, it comes with presence, it comes with this idea of sovereignty, it comes with wearing down the British position. Uh, and already you have this thing where British oil companies, because uh, there was oil found at the Falklands, which again, I was partly the spark setting off events. But you have this um, thing where Argentina is saying like, you know, it's sanctioning or oil companies that work with Britain to extract that will be sanctioned and where it means they can't use their ports logistically. And that, that's a big issue for the region because Argentine, Argentina's coastline, it, 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 that's where it all's happening. It's where the refineries are, it's where the easiest to access. Um, and partly on that thing is China's development and investment in Argentina to help that out. So as a facilitator, and I, I know it's a very controversial term, but it, it's one I quite like, you know, you could call this a, this sort of grey zone strategic competition um, where China is supporting Argentina in its claims, but inadvertently and not taking an official position yet. But on the table, of course, you know, if Taiwan does flare up, um, there could be a, a definitely some sort of quid pro quo going on there in terms of recognising claims. Um, Argentina does lean more towards China than Britain. Uh, Britain tried in the, allegedly there was in sort of the early 2000s, there was an, a British intelligence operation to try and Im influence Argentine public opinion regarding the Falklands. Uh, and if, it, if such a thing did take case, it clearly failed abysmally. Like, it did not have the impact required. So it's still quite a tenuous position. And it means that the military presence there can't really be downscaled. Because, you know, while Argentina at the moment is in no place for any kind of military operation in the future, you know, 10, 20 years, who can say, especially with sort of Chinese investment into their economy? Oh, sorry, Andy, your microphone. Yeah, <laughs> typical. Um, sorry, that's fascinating. In some respects, that answers another question, which is looking at the armaments and, and how that will play out in the future and the, 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 the technology that, that is now in the area and, and the, the, um, the competition that will, will go on. Um, I know from when we were discussing the other day, um, prior to this, you were talking about uh, the three sectors of the government not really understanding why they were there and coming up with sh sort of straw men to explain. Um, and one of them being that, um, well, if you control the Falklands, you can control passage around either Cape Horn or um, uh, Cape of Good Hope. Um, and one of the questions we've had is asking, was, was there ever a serious Japanese attempt in the in the 1940s to um, uh, to take the islands, or was that very much conjecture? I, I no, that's a great question. I, I, I was hoping someone would ask that actually and pick up the Japanese influence because there's a whole story to this. Um, so essentially, at the time, it was considered a sort of tangible belief, but at the time, of course, this kind of panic rush with Japan taking British possessions in Asia, uh, and they're saying, you know, how will we stop this? With you know military forces aren't really there yet to focus on it uh, especially in the context of all of Singapore then that's another huge shock um, so while it, it in practical terms we can kind of look at it and sort of go back and go it's not really realistic it was something that was deemed a potential like target at the time but you know how they would logistically manage that then also does Falkland Islands its strategic value in itself like being able to intercept Cape shipping uh, Drake's Passage yes but again that's a hostile very hostile waters like not a main shipping route like it's again it's sort of up in the air but the Japanese sort of interest in the Antarctic is really in, like a really good point actually to raise because in the 1930s, they are actually trying to make a claim. Japan's very interested in making a claim because of Antarctic whaling. 
Uh, and you have Chile, who's like, you know, it would overlap with Chile's claim and overlap with somewhat with Britain's potentially. And so Chile is very aware of this and doesn't want Japan in there at all. Britain and Australia, of course, are saying, you know, would rather not. This is our kind of our, our sphere. Um, and it goes to the extent that Japan in nine, uh, sets up a sort of polar research institute and decides in sort of around 1939, I believe, to sort of try and send out an Antarctic expedition. Well, World War II, of course, delays that. It doesn't, it never happens. Um, but it was to make claims. Uh, and then you have this really interesting point after the war. And again, this kind of idea that the Allies are still very much concerned about any kind of Japanese presence in that Southern Ocean for, you know, for strange reasons. It's not quite clear. Uh, as you said, Andy, it's sort of, you know, this idea that potentially strategically there could be something there, but we're not quite sure or economically. But Japan, so there's this weird sort of back and forth where they decide they want the UK, Australia, New Zealand want to totally cut out Japan from ever going back to the Antarctic again and from being in the southern waters. Uh, the US, of course, by 1946, when these talks, from 1946 to 1947, when these talks are taking place with the Far Eastern Committee, the US has decided, well, we need Japan rearmed and sort of reintegrated as soon as possible as a sort of buffer to Russia uh, and, you know, dealing with the Korea, that kind of, they want a presence there. And so they decide to allow Japanese whaling back into the Antarctic unilaterally. And this, this sort of sets off a diplomatic crisis where there's the quote is towering rage of ambassadors shouting at each other, the British ambassador, the US ambassador over this, saying, you know, like, you can't just do that on its own. It's We have interests there as well. The US is going like, you know, well, we need this. Meat is a key part. They argue that the whaling meat is key for Japan's economy. It's that's questionable again, but that is sort of just using it for diplomatic means. Um, so Britain sort of is forced to kind of understand like, OK, we'll allow this one. But next time you have to do it in consultation with everyone. We all have to agree to allow Japan back into the Antarctic because it's a sensitive area for us. Uh, the following year, uh, Jap uh, <laughs> the US unilaterally allows Japan to do the whaling expedition again without consulting anyone. And again, it, it sets up huge tensions. There's actually comes to the point where the, if the US is saying to Britain, if you don't back down on this, we're not going to sign this whaling treaty and it will bleed through into what Australia gets from its industrial capacity from Japan as sort of its sort of war reparations. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a one of these small things that sounds like a tiny issue, but becomes big. And again, the reason for it seems to be on Britain's part, particularly in Australia, this fear that you know, there is some strategic value there for the Antarctic and, and different offices, you're right, paint it in a different way. So the Admiralty talks about uh, it being centred on this idea of like controlling shipping routes, the potential also for a transpolar flight route, which again, we know is, is but there's it's always this kind of investment sort of element there to it, like the future, there will be something. Um, and for the Foreign Office and uh, Colonial Office, it's based on this economic idea, and we can blame the Americans mostly for that again. So Americans with Admiral Byrd, who was a great polar explorer and great polar logistics, uh, logistics sort of expert. Uh, he, in 1936, scuppered Britain's plans for their idea of, you know, painting the Antarctic red they had in the 1920s by sending an expedition there, made the sort of Foreign Office realise, oh, we should concentrate on consolidating our claims because now the US is getting interest in this. 1939, with Roosevelt's blessing, as I mentioned, he went down there um, to sort of foment an, an, a US Antarctic claim, uh, established bases right smack down in the middle of Britain's area. So Britain's like, OK, this claim is going and it's a consistent theme. Britain fears the US's claim will overlap with their own. Uh, and but part of that, um, Admiral Birdie comes away with 1,400 odd uh, samples of minerals from the Antarctic, which is like gold, oil, zinc, copper. Uh, and, you know, that kind of adds to the idea of a treasure trove is out there. You've just got to wait until someone can find it and explore it. And it's kind of some in, in you know, he brought um, Argentine and Chilean officers with him on that expedition. That's kind of what galvanized their interest again in it. But from a UK perspective, there's kind of some doubt on that, where they're like, you know, A, you know, in case it's true, we've got to stay. They're also like, where did all these minerals get, you know, did he test the veins? How deep does it go? Did, there's even some sort of comments in diaries where they're saying they don't believe it. Like they know Admiral Byrd is a, he's an Antarctic enthusiast and will do anything to get the US sort of in the region. So like, did he really find all this, you know, or did he take some with him as a kind of, you know, look, Roosevelt, like I found this, we should like go all in. Um, so, yeah, there's this, in, and I, I dub this idea sort of it's Britain's idea of a sort of budget imperialism where they're trying to keep the cost low, the political and financial cost low for being there, in the hope that down the line at an undisclosed point of time, there'll be like a big boon in, like, you know, a big return that could be like world changing. And you have this idea of the Labour's government under Attlee has this idea that, you know, the Antarctic could help them fund their third way in, you know, be, be, re, regaining superpower status alongside the US and USSR. Uh, and the, the minerals for that. And then you have later on the Conservative government under Churchill onwards, and particularly Macmillan, who's saying like the Antarctic is useful to have because they're worried about Britain's mineral supplies for its industry. And the Antarctic could be a good source of minerals that aren't sort of contested in a sort of Cold War context. 
so there's some really interesting stuff there. But again, none of this is based in any kind of analytical reality that we'd accept. Uh, you know, if, if I went to the, the British government and sort of put these points forward, I don't think they'd accept them as like, oh, that's a concrete analysis. It's all very much sort of up in the air and kind of um, imagined, essentially. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I, the, there's a couple of questions which come in, which I'll keep to the end because it's talking about the future of the, the future of Antarctica, and I think it fits fits in. Those will fit in very nicely there. Um, but actually, something else which has been asked, which came up in our discussion, um, was looking at decolonization and the 1950s and India's proposal within the UN in introducing the Antarctic question. Um, how much how much did that influence British willingness to meet some form of international agreement? I would argue based on what I've seen, and there's a great article, I, I think it's by Adrian Hawkins goes into this, and I think Stephen Heavens does some stuff on this as well, um, where I'd argue it actually sort of dub, makes the UK double down. They're actually, you know, according to the official documents, when India argues it's going to raise this at the UN, then starts to follow through with it, there's outrage. They're like, they see it as India interfering in a region that's not there you know it's nothing to do with india it's not they don't see it as a colonization question because there's no indigenous peoples in the antarctic that's a consistent like british perspective on that whereas of course argentina and chile disagree with that they're saying it is british imperialism because you're there where you shouldn't be it's it's part of argentina and chile's like homeland essentially um but they also react with outrage to the indian proposal because they see it as india treading on domestic politics you know they're saying you're trying to internationalize something that is part of Argentina, it's part of our homeland. So you have this weird incidence where there's a united front between Britain, Argentina and Chile to sort of shut down the Indian proposal at the UN. Uh, and in, India is very surprised by this. They thought they would get Argentina and Chile's support. Uh, and it's partly why they kind of withdraw it and nothing really happens or comes from it. Um, but of course, in British sources, they're very keen at saying, while we're, you know, it looks like we're working together, we don't want to help Chile too much because it might legitimize their claims, you know, in Argentina as well. It, we don't want to be seen to like agree with them that they have a right to be here. So they're kind of operating as two separate entities just for the same goal, as opposed to uh, as sort of some narratives argue that it, it's the catalyst for working together. In the reports, I'd argue it's not. They clearly do not want to work together. The Foreign Office and Colonial Office do not want to be seen to work together. Um, so, yeah, it, it is really from India's perspective, of course, you know, they're very interested in the Antarctic question, not necessarily as a decolonizing one, but more to do with environmental imperialism. And this idea that, you know, if the Antarctic becomes a nuclear testing ground, which is a very pressing concern, how would that impact um, the, in, from their perspective, the sort of monsoon weather patterns they rely on? Uh, and how would that impact, you know, their sort of, you know, because it's, it's a region of interest for them. So it, through that, it's a, and that's Adrian Hawkins' work. I'd recommend reading that. He goes a, a lot into the environmental imperialism aspect of the Antarctic and how it influences that. But yeah, I would say it, it you know, it did, I would say it actually didn't have much of an impact on Britain's policy. It did make them aware, again, it was this sort of nightmare scenario where it's raised at the UN. They do not want the UN involved at all. And so I think from that perspective, it did apply pressure. But in terms of the archival evidence for it, they, they, you know, quite quickly want to shut their down, bat it away. Okay, uh, that's really interesting. Um, sort of united, united on a common front, but forever enemies, um, best, best of enemies. Um, now, obviously, the, there's, I mean, the, the, the big item of interest, and you, you've mentioned it, referenced the Falklands conflict and um, where this fed into. And there's really a couple of questions here which link together quite nicely, which is one, when we're looking at sovereignty, does the continental shelf argument um, really extend and does that make it much more difficult for the British government to extend its sovereignty over the Falklands and thus over the rest of the, the, the Antarctic territories? Um, and secondly, obviously, we have a history of sending individuals out um, notable in individuals out on goodwill visits. Um, the late Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, uh, visit to Argentina. And how did that, how, how, how did that go down internally and internationally when you see these competing sovereignty claims? That's a good question. I think to answer the first one, I'm afraid the second one, I'm not uh, an expert. I haven't managed to get to the Argentine archive, so I'm more of a British perspective on this because uh, of COVID, but I, I will get around to that. It would be great. But um, the, so the first question, um, the continental shelf is a really interesting one because essentially it's 
an UNCLOS inspired sort of UN argument that at the time Britain does not accept. They kind of, in documentation, they're laughing at this idea that the Andes mountain range is an extension down into the Antarctic. And they're saying it's ridiculous. It's like, you know, they sort of, there's some quite, they, they have this habit uh, of some like, you know, Argentina and Chile's claims, they just dismiss them as if they're kind of, and there's this reference, uh, and this is where Klaus Dodds has a great argument on like a great piece on the foreign office's stereotyping of Argentina. They kind of treat them as children. Like, you know, they shouldn't be, they're being silly or they're being like, you know, uppity or something like that. Uh, and it's very wrong. Uh, and it gets, and it's what sees Britain's position essentially collapse, um, you know, because they are this underestimation, underestimation of, of um, Argentina and Chile. But so this continental shelf argument, they, they don't give it any credence at the start. They, they do not see it. They do not agree with it. They're like, you know, the, the idea of sovereignty from Argentina and Chile, of course, is it's this Andy mountains range that makes up the Antarctic and these islands part of their sort of domestic you know, countries. Then it's, you know, it's not an international sphere. It's just ours. It's kind of like France with its overseas departments, but in a more kind of geographically linked way. Um, and, and so... It's, it's interesting that now that's become like an accepted thing. And I, I, I would love to sort of have seen if I can find it, you know, how British policy has changed and adapted to UNCLOS is saying whether actually this is a viable thing. You know, you can claim seabed on, uh, based on this. Um, I'd quite like to see like how the change in attitude happens. And that might be something to look into on that. Um, but yeah, but Britain's idea of sovereignty, of course, they, they don't recognize it. They see their sovereignty as being based on discovery, exploration, and this idea of administration and use, whereas Argentina and Chile, it's this geography, it's uh, inheritance of historic treaties, like the 1494 Treaty of Torcidelis, among others, uh, as well as this administration and use. And it's where the administrative use part is where they both compete, because they both recognize that as being like, oh, actually, this is a viable sovereign kind of claim. But they compete in different ways. So for Britain, it's the regulation of, you know, whaling. It's the regulation of activity, and, and it's those people who are being regulated accept British regulation of that, uh, as well as the scientific output. Uh, and this is why you get whaling becomes important. So um, Argentine and Chilean whaling uh, companies actually pay money and like to license. Uh, their whaling activities in the Falkland Island dependencies and Britain uses this as part of the case look your own people are, you know they recognize our sovereignty for this this is a great boon for us and again in other international whalers like Norwegian uh, Norwegian whalers going in are a great boon for this as well um, Argentina and Chile of course don't have that same economic basis so what they're doing is they're, they they dismiss the discovery stuff because they're like 1494 you know, that, that divided up the world. It doesn't matter, like, you know, who discovered what. And they're also like proximity trumps your discovery because they also, it's disputed who discovers what, like it, there's an all sort of age of exploration stuff. It's it's quite difficult to track, you know, you can, you can say there's quite a good thing, for instance, um, Edward Branfield was the first person to sort of lay eyes on the Antarctic continent, but not all states recognize that. So it's quite a disputed kind of claim to make, which is what Britain tries to push. Um, so Argentina and sort of Chile, on their administrative purposes, there's a, about scientific gathering. And in 1904, Argentina's sort of claims are really kickstarted when um, a Scottish sort of expedition essentially hands them a weather station on Laurie Island because the British government were not interested in sort of picking it up. So they go, the Scots are down there. They're like, you know, we've established a weather station. Would you like to fund us? And the British government's like, not really. No, we don't see the point. And so they go to then Argentina quite fairly saying, well, would you like be interested in collecting weather, you know, this weather kind of information we're doing? And Argentina's like, yes. And they fund them, they help them. They then take over the station, like, you know, by mutual agreement. And so from 1904, Argentina actually has the claim of being the longest permanent scientific presence in the Falklands, and that's a key part of their claim because of this incident. And again, because the British government at the time it wasn't only until sort of 1920 when we realized, like, oh, maybe we actually shouldn't have done that. And Argentina, it's like Laurie Island is now, you know, Argentine sovereign territory because of this agreement. Britain views it though as it's just the station. The station was given away in a commercial transaction. The island remains British, and you're there because we let you be there. And so there becomes in 1925 this idea when Argentina erects again a, tele a telegraph pole uh, for communications and sort of start laying down lines there without asking Britain's permission, Britain then gets like, okay, that's a sovereignty. Again, that's the administration use coming into it. They're trying to say like, look, we're providing development and we're providing a usage and benefit. Uh, and so Britain sort of kicks its heels in saying, you can't do that. that. That's what we do. And so that's when you get this idea of, you know, the postal ships and sort of stuff set up and postmasters on like random empty islands, essentially. Uh, and the second point about, sorry, I know it was a long answer on that, but same point about, I, I'm not, I can't really say again on that point. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm qualified. I, I would say broadly from a non-expert position to say, you know, uh, what was the impacts of Prince's visit? Um, I, 
I would say not much because again, like by that point, you you have the the target tree systems in place. You have this kind of you know the, the methods of competition are known, and it doesn't change the rhythm really. So you you've got in the Antarctic, you've got you know Antarctic tree system. What happens is there's a continuation of like scientific discoveries, continuation of this uh, competition down there, um, and in the Falkland Islands, like. It's, I'd say the counterpart that I do know is you had Perone uh, and Ava visit the UK uh, and there was this big thing about that and they were very worried about like receiving them and sort of this, uh, especially um, Eva Perone uh, and like how to tackle that. And there's a whole like cabinet document dedicated just to her and how to deal with her because it's, it's a difficult question. Like, you know, how, how much do we give away? How much are we legitimizing their sovereign claims? What are we doing there? So I'd assume on the Argentine side, the same part, the same thing sort of happens. Uh, and so there's great efforts to go to mitigate any kind of sense of like this will have an international impact this will have an impact on the sovereignty question but yeah i would like to know more about that that's a great question fascinating um i've got one more question from here um and then i'm gonna lump a few together to to um bring us out and i know it's not potentially an area of, of expertise however what we're seeing going on at the moment in in Ukraine. Um, do you think that that is going to impact the situation in the Falklands um, in the future? Yeah, I'd say yes. And in this, I'm, I can't say I'm like a sort of leading, you know, uh, coming up with new stuff. I know Klaus Dodds has done some talks on this already that I very much agree with, to be honest, where uh, Ukraine in this sort of, it represents especially you have the arctic and antarctic and you never compare the two like you know scholars are adamant these are not comparable at all you should never compare but we're going to compare them uh because everyone else <laughs> tends to do that so the arctic council you've seen this kind of disintegration it's paused it's the first time it's history and cooperation has ceased the antarctic is slightly different where it's a treaty system as opposed to just being a sort of more like informal council but you're seeing changes there as well where there's the potential where if a party stops engaging within it in good faith that's more of an issue than necessarily if something scraps it and you know that's where this battle is going on between roughly i'd say russia and china are up against sort of britain and ironically argentina and chile there's a lot of sort of scrapping over this idea where they want to conserve areas and you know make sure it's not exploited and this idea that the you know the antarctic is a continent of science and that's fine um where whereas for russia and china they, they're saying you know does this treaty system work it's a bit outdated there's a melting antarctic now um shouldn't we start looking at opportunities to exploit that because we're definitely going to need the resources potentially and you know if it does melt what then like it becomes a normal continent and unlike the arctic where it's an arctic ocean it's a continent under there so what's that going to look like and you know and that's very long-term thinking but the sort of battle for it is now and you've got this date i think it's 2048 where it's up for sort of revision and that's like a big date so you've got a lot of scientific activity and in this context i'd argue you could place where britain's been like you know uh recently the royal research ship david attenborough and sort of you know commissioning that and re reinvigorating its dockyards down there and that's again i would argue going back to the sovereign presence thing so if suddenly the freezing of the claims is like you know one party decides to ignore that or they're you know just sort of shifted away to not be as important and not to be that protective layer then everything's back on the table uh, and this is where shirley scott's got a great article on this where she's arguing that um so article for the antarctic treaty system that actually freezes claims is like american imperialism and it's not something I understand to agree with, but, you know, it, it's um, the America, the US was able to benefit the most from the Antarctic Treaty System, putting up all these bases, which China is doing now as well. China's mirroring what the US has done, where they're having like a lot of research stations, a lot of physical presence, a lot of activity. So if, for instance, if at any point the sovereignty aspect comes off on the table, suddenly you've got all these bases ready, you've got all this activity, you've got all this presence. And I think that's something that Britain only clicked to in sort of, you know, 2010 onwards, where that actually this is a looming issue and we might need to like re-solidify our claims. Um, so will it put more investment into it? Um, so yeah, I, I think, and Ukraine is again, is part of this deterioration in relations between Russia and sort of the West on this. Um, and, and that will bleed through into the Antarctic Treaty because, you know, Russia's already been evicted from the sort of, you know, pause on the Arctic Council. Uh, so it will be interesting to see the meeting notes because I know the Antarctic Treaty System publishes like a sanitized version of the minutes of what their sort of meetings, but any kind of information you can glean from that because there's already issues where Russia has been doing illegal fishing in the area. Uh, and not necessarily, uh, you know, I would say allegedly, but the, the Australians said it proved that the Antarctic Treaty Organization has actually sort of slapped on the wrist a bit as well. So there is this kind of activity where they're breaking sort of the parameters of the treaty and whether this will escalate that, I would probably say yes, because again, the sort of treaty is 
just been for the last 20 years been creaking under its own weight. It's not a very modern tool and it's not one that takes into account climate change and sort of this very ge the geopolitical changes as well where China wants in. Yeah, very, very comprehensive. And I think, um, as you say, it's hugely fluid. And I think that all of that brings us quite ne neatly to, to the final part of this jigsaw, which really is as the as as the Antarctic changes physically, are we going to see um, more exploitation in terms of it, has it become a free exploitation zone for minerals, for um, for for what? whatever for fishing for resources um if it does if it has is becoming that free exploitation zone are we going to see further habitation and therefore when you put all of that together what do you see really being the future of the antarctic treaty system i that's a great question i, I tend to be and I, you know i get sorry i tend to be quite cynical and a pessimist when it comes to international treaties uh, and their kind of longevity because, uh, you know, circumstances in the geopolitics change and then the treaty has to either adapt or it's chucked. Uh, and what you're seeing now is the start of the adaptation phase where there's this struggle over what does the ATS mean? How can we sort of deal with it? Because, of course, its face is poor. 1980s, um, there was a push by Britain to, like, let's mine the Antarctic. And there was a kickback against that, particularly by Australia, who wanted sort of a conservation element to it. And so it never happened. But that's going to reopen now with even sort of greater access behind it and sort of more focus on mining but yeah yeah longer term there's really like i think there will be a shift under the treaty firstly of sort of more exploitation and it will probably start with like illegal fisheries it's, it's you already see there's the disputes now over whether to create more fishing conservation zones and it's unlikely that will happen now the, the disagreement's too much they managed to get some like victories in setting some up um i believe it's in the west sort of where the western region uh we're in the falklands or islands fences near around that they've got some fisheries there uh, for conservation but like trying to expand on that has been difficult and it doesn't look likely it will go ahead now uh, i would say you know i could be very wrong on this but i would say in this current context i don't think agreement's going to be forthcoming uh, and then the mineral exploitation as i mentioned australia's already accused china of like you know m misinterpreting what it's doing down there as you know taking samples for research versus prospecting and setting up there and you know I, I think you know again single perspective i think everyone honestly is attached to prospecting you know the scientific research is good but there's going to be a usage element from that uh, again going back to like you know the sort of 1942 1961 fids for britain was all about prospecting mapping and sort of sovereignty it wasn't about science for the science's sake and that didn't really change on the ats i would argue you get an international space station before you get significant international cooperation under the ats uh, so they, and even today, you have a lot of the sort of cooperation that does happen tends to be the claimant states don't tend to leave their claimed areas much. They tend to focus their resources on their slivers of where, you know, of, of the Antarctic. So again, there's this sovereignty production aspect to it. And you could say it's more scientifically now than sort of sovereignty, but it's still there in the background. Um, in terms of habitation, I, I think that's a great, I think it's the World Economic Forum has sort of showcased the idea of Antarctic cities. And like this sort of area where you can grow land and, uh, you know, there'll be arable land to farm and sort of fertile areas because of climate change. And I think that's very interesting. And I think that would uh, you, you kind of have that where Argentina currently they, they sort of do this thing where they make sure that they've had uh, Argentine citizens born in the Antarctic because that sees a way of solidifying their claim because it's a population. Because the key point has always been the Antarctic not has has no sort of indigenous people. So they're trying to sort of essentially create the case that they are one. Uh, and, you know, when you reach out to habitable sort of thing, as it becomes more and more habitable, that becomes more and more of an issue. Uh, where does this sort of, you know, push towards the, you, you know, it, this person was born here, this village is here, this, these people are now on the mainland as well as these islands, and they're able to live there more comfortably. And of course, there's like a hundred year timeline on war, but it, it is something to start considering. And I, I can see that happening uh, as a kind of way, because it already is. Again, Argentina and Chile are already interested in that. Um, so, yeah, I, and I think longer term, just to quickly say, I think it would, I think the Antarctic Treaty System will be pushed aside longer term. I, I cannot see how, with the differences in international order that China and Russia have, and even Argentina and Chile compared to Britain and the US, these sort of different approaches to it, I, unless they can find common ground, which was science, but now science is sort of being circumvented for activity that does other stuff, um, sort of is other focused or more on sovereignty, more on extraction. I don't see how you can keep going the sort of the mutual agreement to abide by treaty rules that's needed. And the treaty itself, you know, the British Britain's interpretation had its own like regulatory force as well that had powers to intervene. It's quite loose. 
it's up to sort of the members to police themselves. And it's also quite an exclusionary club. And of course, you know, as more and more parties get involved in that, they'd like a seat at the table. It's something that's happened in the Arctic as well. The Arctic Council, you've got more and more states having Arctic policies with interests in the region. How do you tackle that? The answer is current sort of organisations can't really. So they'd have to adapt. And I see it more likely as it being the treaty is scrapped and either something put in its place that's far more looser and open to exploitation or, you know, uh, yeah, or, or, or more comp or competition ensues again. Not necessarily military, but just competition and sort of a scramble for this kind of, you know, what's still a sort of unclaimed frontier when you get under the ATS. Sam, thank you. That's that's a fantastic place to end um, because the final chapter is not yet written. Um, there's much to come. But actually understanding the background to this, it, it is, as somebody said, it's so pivotal to, to understanding what is going on in the future and how we got to today. Um, so thank you very much for that. I, it's evidently an area that you're passionate about and I'm glad that we were able to share it um, today. I'm very sorry to everybody who I wasn't able to get to your questions, um, but there's some fantastic stuff there. And if, if possible, please just email uh, myself and I can get, get those to Sam. If you come to me at andrewy at rusi.org, I can I can pass your comments or questions on, on to Sam. So I'm sure he'd be be thrilled to to connect with people. Um, so I'd like if everybody could join me in thanking you, Sam. It has been brilliant. Um, that concludes today's today's lecture um, or webinar, sorry. Um, but the next webinar in the military history series is scheduled for Thursday, the 21st of April. The subject will be the Falklands War, the politics, military actions and outcomes. And it will be a discussion between Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, Sir David Oman and Suki Cameron. Uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman wrote the official history of the Falklands War. Sir David Oman is a distinguished fellow at RUSI and was a private secretary to the UK Secretary of State for Defence during the conflict. And Suki Cameron, who was born in the Falklands, works during the war in the Falkland Islands Association office here in London. Uh, she was subsequently and until recently representative of the Falklands Island government in London. And detail of the events will be on the RUSI website, as will, I'm sure, the, um, some, some of the bits from here today. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to Sam and look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday, 